<laughs> talking to two guys like I'm like what is she talking about at least she's got some hair okay that doesn't look good hey everybody and welcome to chef aj live i'm your host chef aj and this is where i introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that i think you should know about if you follow me regularly you know that i just finished hosting my annual truth about weight loss summit we're actually going to have a free replay weekend starting thursday night at midnight for 72 hours if you missed it or want to catch up on some of the interviews that you want to see again and these two gentlemen were actually scheduled to come on together as a duo and what happened was is one of them had to work because they are both doctors and they both work and so they ended up doing solo interviews, which actually benefited the summit greatly, but I missed that opportunity of having them together, which we are now making up for today. And it's perfect because it's not only Black History Month, coincidentally, but they have a wonderful project that they work with. It's called Slave Food Project. They're going to talk about that, how they came together. They have a fantastic YouTube channel. They even interviewed Michael Moss, something that I've been trying to do for 10 years. They're friends. They're awesome plant-based doctors. Their names are Dr. Columbus Batiste and Dr. Eric Walsh, and please welcome both of them to the show. Hello, hello. It's good to see you again. Oh, it's always great to see you. And how are you doing, Dr. Walsh? Doing well. Uh, the snow's starting to melt here in Connecticut, so things are good. <laughs> I never understand how somebody leaves California. Exactly. <laughs> Taxes. Onward. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to know how you guys, and by the way, both the feedback for both of your talks on the summit was just, I'm not kidding. They, they loved both of you. And so I'm kind of glad that you, Dr. Walsh, you had to work that day because we ended up getting two for the price of one. So how did you guys come together and why do you do this project called Slave Food? Oh, man. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start off with, with the answer in that. So we actually graduated from a historically black college and university. And, and I'll tell you what's ironic as a, a born and bred Southern California kid leaving from Southern California, where I had gotten into UCLA to go to Alabama was a shock to everyone around me <laughs> that I did that. But I got I had the opportunity not only to meet great people like Eric Walsh, but also my wife, right? So I met her in college too. So it was definitely an investment well, well made. And so we connected there and reconnected back out um, during my medical school and residency time when I, I saw Eric again, uh, when he had returned from, from graduating. And uh, that's, how we, that's how our relationship was really built. You know, that was how our relationship was built. I don't know, Eric, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, we were, you know, pre-med at the school and then we re we ran into each other again at Loma Linda University. Um, I was in, I just started residency and I think Columbus was like halfway through medical school um, and we ran into each other again. And um, we became synergistic, I think, around this project because in medicine, and I don't care what, what color doctor you are, if you're paying attention one of the things you begin to see is the incredible disease burden that African-Americans have. It's not just African-Americans. We see this with Latinos. We see this with um, Native Americans, um, uh, Pacific Islanders, and others, that they're disproportionately, some people just have a unique burden of disease. Um, and then you start to ask yourself why and how you fix it. Um, and uh, as a physician, sometimes it doesn't make sense. When I when I did my doctorate in public health, um, also at Loma Linda University, that's when I really be it began to crystallize that there are things called social determinants of health that actually work upstream from disease. That actually is what makes people healthy or not healthy in ways most of us, uh, you know, can't see or understand. Wow, you you haven't been plant based that long, have you, Dr. Walsh? Um, on and off. I, I gave up eating meat a long time ago, but to go whole full-fledged plant-based has been the last couple of years, yeah. That's great. Did Dr. Batiste influence you at all in that direction? Yeah, he was, um, Dr. Batiste is a, is, is a good example of the plant-based lifestyle. We've been places where there's been like marginally food. It's not bad food, but it's not great food. And he'll just not eat anything. <laughs> it just, he'll wait and eat later. And I was like, man, that guy, he's got some serious <laughs> self-control. Um, so he'll just wait till he can get home and make brown rice and beans and, you know, some <laughs> kale. Rather, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, Columbus? We've been at like churches presenting and, they bring, and, and, and it's, <laughs> yeah. and it's, it's their health day and they bring out these horrible foods to eat on health day and we're like uh this isn't good so you know i might eat a little of whatever they have and he'll be like nope i'm not eating i'll wait you know he just wait till they get to home so they can have a really healthy meal which is which is very um admirable That's yeah but it, but it's but it's not very smart right so it's not smart on my part and you know aj you can speak to this because planning is everything 
planning is everything. And so anticipating those, those landmines that all of us are going to encounter for things that may not be ideal, it's not good to fast when you're really starving, <laughs> when it's not anticipatory fasting. Well, you it's, actually talk planning. about that in your talk about the planning. So physician, heal thyself. You need to start carrying food with you. <laughs> exactly. And, exactly. That, and, that, and carrying food with you is, becomes difficult sometimes. You know, if, you, if you're traveling on a plane cross country or you're going to be traveling for hours and hours and hours, you, you, you almost have to look at the airport and see what they have available because it is hard to pack because you can't pack liquids and get on the plane. I mean, it, 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 it's challenging. So the planning can get tough, but there's always a way. I mean, if you go online, look at what's in the, available in the airport, most airports now do have somewhere you can get something decent and healthy, even if it's just a fruit and vegetable smoothie, um, which is what our airport has. Like they have a fruit and spread. So if you, before you get on a plane, you can at least buy one of those and be okay on the flight. But um, planning is important and um, nobody plans to fail. They simply fail to plan. I love that. The only airport that I, I had struggled with was Memphis. That was the only airport I couldn't find fruit or vegetable at. That, that makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. But isn't it interesting <laughs> that churches are notorious like hospitals for actually serving the least healthy food to their people? Yeah, yeah. Dick Gregory, Dick um, Gregory, the black comedian, had a great saying. He said, um, we go to black church, you go to a funeral to bury someone, and literally we feed people the very same food that put the person in the ground. Um, and you're right. I mean, sometimes churches are the worst. Part of it is because they don't understand the spiritual um, ramifications of diet. Uh, and that's something that part of what we talk about sometimes at churches is how fasting and um, eating right and eating compassionately actually helps clear the mind and makes you more able to be in tune with the things that are spiritual. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. So I, I just I, I mentioned this just the other day. I have a nurse and I've big, I apostol, apostolize eating healthful and wellness and everything of that sort. And so there was a nurse for Lent who decided that she was going to go back and go plant-based. Now I've worked with everyone. I've given lectures within the cath lab confines. And so yesterday she saw me as I was rushing out and she said to me, she's like, you know, doc, I got to tell you, I've been doing this. It feels the first couple of days are like a detox, but I feel better. I feel clearer. I feel sharper. And that is the consistent theme that everyone hears. And so that, that, that clarity that Eric speaks about, it's something that's pervasive. We all see it and it all comes out and it's so important to embrace it. And once again, why go back? And that's what we were, she and I were talking about. It's like, why do you go back when you feel better? Go back to, to eating the foods that put, you, that put you inside of this kind of zombie state. I think because it's a, just like what Dr. Walsh talked about on the summit, because he his talk was all about food addiction. I think it's because that's why people got back. Why do people go back to the abusive boyfriend? It's the same thing. There's there's yes. getting something out of it. Yes. Yeah, it, it, we, a lot of us are codependent on food. Um, you know, I, when I used to do addiction medicine, we used to do a, a stop smoking class. And I remember when they were training us to teach the veterans, this was at a VA hospital in Loma Linda, um, the classes, one of the things they told us was many of these veterans, when they had something good happen in their life, they celebrated with a cigarette. If they mm -hmm. lost their job, they mourned with a cigarette. If they lost a family member, they smoked a cigarette. If a baby was born, they smoked a cigarette. Literally emotionally, they never truly experienced life without the impact of nicotine which is profound so that when they finally go to quit, you've now got to deal with life without any filter, without any buffer from these chemicals. And, I, and I've come to the conclusion that, especially after talking to Michael Moss and reading his book uh, several times, that this is the same thing with food. A lot of us have never had to live life without the power of these modernized kind of Franken foods that are mood changing. They literally change your mood. Um, so when you when something good happens, you go out to eat to celebrate. Something horrible happens, you go home and you eat, and it, that makes it so difficult. So you 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 might feel better for the forty days of Lent while you give up these foods, but you are trained after Lent that when something emotional happens, for the good or for the bad, I've kind of got to blunt it by having the food that I associate with that event. Mm -hmm. We haven't changed the routine. So that cue is still there, that event, that trauma, that frustration, that life event that then leads you back into the same sort of fake reward system that's there in form of this habit loop. And the, the crazy part is, is that it starts at such a, er, er, an early age. 
you know, and that's, you know, you have the Coke, you have the commercials with the sodas and they're, they're showing the, the emotions and the relationship between the father and the son and, and going out. And, you know, I, I used to always tell the story about with my dad, it's kind of going out with my dad. I still can smell the place whenever I tell this story. I remember going out and he loves <laughs> soft serve ice cream and pineapple on top. And I can remember this little grimy place that sold this. I remember the specific smell and it brings back this memory. And the memory is not just a memory, it's a sense of emotion that's there. Right. Of this bonding, this, this relationship mm -hmm. that I have that's lost. And so you can imagine, so it's, it's, not, it's not surprising why people do this, just like what you're saying. So what can we do instead of medicating uh, our mood with food? Because, like, you know, one of the experts on the summit, one of the food addiction experts, Dr. Joe Nifflin, said that you can addict anybody to any substance if you give it to them early enough and often enough. Mm. Absolutely true. And I think one of the things you have to throw in there for our project, when we're specifically, this being Black History Month, when we're specifically addressing the health disparities that impact Black America, um, you have to remember that, that all of what we're saying is compounded by the weight of race and racial issues in this country. So um, you know, if you expose someone to something early enough and often enough, they will become addicted. They, you know, I, I've met people who are very straight laced, never had a drink in their life, have have an orthopedic um, surgery done. And after seven days of taking the um, pain medicines, they're addicted to them. So it can happen to anyone, it, it really can. But if you throw in stress and if you throw in um, some of the big challenges that whole groups of people in this country face, it becomes even more easy. So again, you have to look upstream a little bit. One, look at advertising. Who, mm -hmm. what is the advertising like? You know, I, I used to think advertising wasn't very powerful, but I read study after study after study that says that what we watch on television during the commercials and during the show. So I used to think it was just the commercials, but actually during the show is just as potent. If Product people are smoking place, cigarettes yeah. on the show, if they place, place products, if someone speaks about meat in a certain way or cheese in a certain way, all of that are the, like the mirror neurons in our brain want to do what they're showing. So one of the things that has to happen to me is that you, we've got to find a way to begin to remove some of these things from in front of people. african Americans, we're talking about Black History Month, really the only group in the country where menthol cigarettes were advertised to them, a more dangerous form of cigarettes, and malt liquor was advertised, a cheaper, mm -hmm. kind of more dangerous form of alcohol um, was, was advertised. And you could see this in black magazines, billboards in our neighborhoods, um, advertised disproportionately. So when we talk about how do you undo some of this stuff, some of it you got to step upstream and say, we don't want six-year-old children walking past billboards with certain foods on them their entire life. We don't want them when they watch, you know, black entertainment television or, or one of any other uh, kind of ethnic programming on any channel, you don't want them to be disproportionately targeted by fast food companies or junk food companies. And that is what the research actually shows is happening. Why, why, you know, it's so funny. I'm so embarrassed to admit it. I used to smoke when I was much younger and it was a bad idea because I'm vegan and I, I'm asthmatic, but I always smoked menthol. Why would they do that with menthol? Um, the menthol cigarettes were supposed to be um, smoother in taste. Um, there's some who would say it actually is a better delivery of nicotine. So it's actually more addicting. Um, but you could tell people it was like healthier. Um, uh, you know, so some say it was cheaper to make, but the menthol cigarettes are just just one of the ways to try and hook uh, black people. You know, so if you're a, if you produce an addictive product that changes mood, who would make really good customers? People who are chronically stressed. Stressed out. And uh, the food industry, I think, on some level understands that. Never mind you add in the fact that many of these individuals don't have the same financial resources, so you can make these products cheaper more dangerous, more addictive, um, and you're gonna make a lot of money off of people that you otherwise wouldn't have made a dime off of. That's and it's, important, it's important to mention too as well that this, the idea of menthol cigarettes has now kind of transitioned into this vaping and this, mm. this flavor vaping that's Absolutely. there for kids and so forth with all these things. And it's becoming essentially an epidemic in and of itself that's going to lead to ill consequence out there. 
You know, it's interesting though, cigarettes are not cheap anymore. They're not, right? They, they, they keep getting more and more expensive. And one of the things with cigarettes is whether people uh, s still smoke, I don't think anybody's walking around thinking so smoking is healthy. And it's certainly not really socially acceptable anymore. You can't smoke in most workplaces. And, uh, and it's funny because Dr. Lyle, when I had him on the show, said that a lot of people ended up quitting just because of the inconvenience of having to take the elevator and go outside, <laughs> things like that. But with processed food, there seems to be a whole different culture that it's, we, they don't look at it the same way, even though it's just as deleterious. You know, you go to your kid's soccer game, Krispy Kreme donuts, and, and kids are eating, all this crap is targeted to children, you know? Yes. Well, if you can, if, just like your, your addiction specialist said, if you can get somebody on early enough, uh, which if you're at a company, you know, what you want is that you want someone hooked for life. I mean, so, you know, when I was a little kid, we, my mother didn't buy sodas. But I can tell you, I was young um, when I first had a thing of Dr. Pepper. I was, that was it. I was, it was a wrap. I didn't get it often, but if I was ever anywhere where they offered a Dr. Pepper, I wanted a Dr. Pepper. And I was a loyal Dr. Pepper customer all the way through college. Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew, partly because they had more caffeine so I could stay up and study, but I, I developed a taste for them. Um, so yes, they will target these things to children um, because they want lifelong customers. Well, that should not be allowed. No, absolutely sure. not. It should. It should. It absolutely not. It should not be allowed. And you know that, that's that's the point. Is the fact that these companies are about business, and you know we say it often, we say it frequently, but the business of business is business, and they're out to make money, not to preserve your health. And so it's by any means necessary in order to, to accomplish that. And so what better than to keep a consumer coming back for more and more? And that's why I think all three of us really love the way Michael Moss pulled the veil back from the food industry to allow us to peer in and see how they go through this level of manipulation uh, in terms of, of adjusting like we're a chemical experiment, the right precise amount that will differ between the three of us that will keep us coming back for more. And for when there is a packaging issue, well, let's allow you to, to make your own titration through these powdered sugary beverages so you can make it sweeter or less sweeter the way that you want and targeting our kids and hiding these components inside of every food. And that's one of the things why, why I oftentimes will say, listen, folks get caught up too much. And so some of your, your audience may, hate, may not like this, but get caught up on vegan or vegetarian. But the reality of it is the problem is standard American diet style. That too many people are eating standard American diet style filled with salt, sugar, and fat. And they're just saying it's vegan it's standard American diet, vegan style, standard American diet, vegetarian style. And that's why there was a, a wonderful study that was done out of the American College of Cardiology that pointed distinctly the fact that those who are eating this unhealthful, quote unquote, plant-based diet that really is highly refined and processed, they aren't any healthy. So yes, you're preserving the environment. Yes, you're preserving animal rights, but you are killing human rights to, uh, to living life <laughs> full to its rich level that's there. Yeah. So well, let I, me say this. Uh, being, be, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I, no, I didn't want to interrupt you. I just want to let people know that you guys have, because people are saying these guys are great. They should have their own show. And I'm like, well, they do. And it's <laughs> called Slave Food. And you have a, a little over a thousand subscribers right now. So what I'm asking everyone to do is just to please hit that button and subscribe to your Slave Food channel. And then at some point, I'd like to know why you called it that and what you guys talk about. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, um, uh, uh, now my thoughts miss me. I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it was tag team. What was the last thing you said, Columbus? I mean, I was, I was talking about really the, uh, what was I talking about? The, <laughs> the salt sugar fat, you know, and, and just. Oh, this. yeah. And I, I was, I, I think I was going to piggyback on when you said, um, the, the, the American Academy, American College of Cardiology yes. uh, did the study that showed that it's not any healthier. Um, the one, I just read something the other day because I was looking at my budget and I was like, wow, you know, how could you, how can you improve your budget? And I happened to run across this great article that showed, in fact, it is more expensive to eat processed, packaged, uh, quote unquote, vegan foods yeah. than it is if you eat the food in its whole form, where you yeah. go to these stores and you buy the uh, beans 
and you soak them yourself and you make big pots of them. You can make two, three pots of different types of beans on a Sunday, have beans for the week. Um, and it was showing you that from a cost perspective, that's something that we're not, um, we're not saying very well either. We're not really talking about the fact that, um, you know, th there's a cost difference. It's not just an, a health difference. It's also a cost difference, which might motivate some folk as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you think about it, right? So, I mean, my, my, my family's from New Orleans. And so my grandmother, I remember we called her, you know, D, Medea, and so forth. And so she was down south. And so it was red beans and rice. It was greens. It was very sparse in terms of meat. Because why? Because it wasn't affordable. And so these are the food constructs of many of the blue zones around the world are basically the goal is to eat like a pauper, live like a king. That's really the goal. When you eat the foods of the earth. You know, whether it's the corn and squash, uh, if I'm from a Latino country, if it's, if it's the root foods and vegetables from a West African heritage, uh, the beans, legumes, the rice, these are the things that are comprised really truly a healthful diet. So what is Slave Food and why is your venture together called the Slave Food Project and your YouTube channel called that? I'll let Columbus take this one. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, so so when we looked at the idea of slave food, as we were kind of coming, so slave food, first and foremost, it is the manipulation of nutrition for profit and for power. That's clear. You see, we've just been talking about it this whole entire time. We've spoken really about how the food industry, their goal is to manipulate the food, not for our health, but for profit. Not to, to manip manipulate it for our wellness, but for power to have more, sh more shelf space that's there is number one. And, and so we, what we do is we take our listeners through a journey of how this has been applied throughout the history of the African-American journey in one aspect, but also how it's also applied to the, the, the perspective of Americans as, as a whole. So we walk folks through this journey from the slave era time, but we also focus really in this construct, this new construct of this food deserts and food swamps where you have this plethora. So what we outline to people are all the components of what we spoke about before. Slave food is not just a historical connotation. It's more of a double entendre, more of a triple entendre. You're looking at, you're enslaved to your environment. You're enslaved to finances. The fact that perhaps through gover government subsidies, and finances and WIC and SNAP that you're limited in types of food that you can purchase, that the bus limits perhaps the amount of bags you can carry if you were to go grocery shopping, that now when you're faced and you're choosing what to eat and you're stressed out, that the advertisement, that also a component from dairy checkoff goes to subsidize, which means your tax dollars to subsidize foods that have been subsidized where by the fact the Journal of American Medical Association showed that if you consume the foods that the government subsidizes, you're more inclined to have cardiometabolic disease, right? Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, you know, all of these variables that are there. So it's deeper. We're all enslaved to these things. Uh, you know, AJ, I mean, before I first met you, I'm, I'm gonna give you credit for my, in part for the transformation, your, your role in my transformation when I met you. I remember going to the grocery store and when I had committed to move from eating any and everything or a junk food, a terry and vegetarian diet <laughs> to eating a whole food plant-based diet. I remember having all my food on the conveyor belt at the grocery store line. And we've all been in the grocery store line and what surrounds us on each side, candy and sodas and chips. And so I'm really diligent. I'm eating just this healthful food and I'm sitting there waiting, waiting as the person's looking to write their check and do everything of that sort. And at the last minute, I snatched the candy off the side. Not one, but two of them. I put it on the conveyor belt and the checkout clerk says to me, man, I thought for a second you were the healthiest person I'd ever seen in my 20 years working here until I realized you're just like us. You're just like us. Those words just rang in my head and they stayed there with me. The fact that I was addicted despite what I wanted to do, I was still going in. I was enslaved to this product. <laughs> despite the knowledge of the harm it would cause me, despite being a cardiologist and seeing people come in with blockages at an early age and having diabetes and ill effects. So that's in part uh, overriding, but Eric, chime in. Well, one of the things I want to say, and actually this is something from even before when we were talking about um, like kind of reasons why people should go whole food plant-based. I, I really do love the fact that people are looking at cruelty to animals 
you know, I have, um, you know, in my journey in this, as I've read and seen things, I'm really blown away by just how cruel it is. And I've, I've been able to visit some farms and stuff. And I was just like, man, this is, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not an animal. We have a, a cat and a rabbit here and I, I probably paid them the least amount of attention than anybody, but so I love animals, but I'm not, a, you know, I'm not just not that animal person, but I can't believe the cruelty. So I, I get that part. The environment, same thing. You know I mean? You look at the pollution, the, you know, global, the overall trend of the world and warming, all terrible. But when you look at black people, black people die now. You know, there's a movie the day after tomorrow about the, the, the environment mm. collapsing on us. And the truth of the matter is African-Americans need this message. Fortunately, it will, it will benefit those other two, two uh, areas of uh, um, the, the animals and the environment. But black people need this now. When we talk about in the slave food project, we talk about life expectancy a lot. Last year, life expectancy dropped for all, overall for Americans, probably because of the coronavirus pandemic by about a year. For African Americans, it dropped th almost three years. Mm -hmm. So, and it, and and that means that the gap, which was anywhere from around seventy years to eighty-seven years for an Asian American between a Black American and Asian American, like seventeen years, that gap just got bigger. So, when we talk about slave food, we talk. It's not just what you put in your mouth. It's the pressure, the stress. Um, that is placed upon you that also shortens life. So we do a lot of talking about how stress causes disease, mm -hmm. microaggressions, racial microaggressions. And before we went on live and we were talking about all three of our collective experiences of prejudice, bias, and bigotry, those things impact um, your health. Um, when people think you're less than, people assume you're ignorant. Mm -hmm. People assume you're dangerous. You know, as a black man, if I'm if I'm walking down the street and I walk up on a, a, a non-black couple and he grabs her poor purse to protect it from me, um, I walk into a store and you know people follow me around, but they don't follow other people around. Those things uh, actually do weigh on you from a health perspective um, because you release massive amounts of cortisol and stay in a constant state of fight or flight. And that constant state of fight or flight is incredibly, incredibly dangerous because we weren't designed to be in a constant state of fight or flight. Um, and this is what a lot of African-Americans and other minority groups have to deal with. And it makes, one, it makes food the, the bad foods almost seem to taste better. That's why they're called comfort foods. Um, um, and we, we always say stress equals dessert spelled backwards. So one of the things that happens when you get caught up in this is that now you flood those very neighborhoods with these comfort foods and you make the people slaves to these foods. And I always say, there's a you've got to get off of the plantation of junk food, the plantation of fast food, the plantation of dairy and meat, um, all of these different plantations. You need liberation nutrition. And liberation nutrition allows you to be freed from these things, which allows you to be freed from disease because the other side of slave food is you become hooked up to dialysis machines, um, you take medications for the rest of your life, and you need procedures that you otherwise would not have needed. And people, here's what people say, it's too difficult to change my diet, but I'm okay having my chest ripped open to have um, to, uh, uh, cardiothoracic surgery. I'm okay having to go to dialysis three times a week, but don't ask me to change what I eat on a day-to-day -day basis, which is mind-blowing, honestly. Yeah. Well, you talked about how the that if you have a like a McDonald's in your neighborhood, like the, the the outcome, the more likely you are to have diseases just based on having it in your neighborhood, whether you eat there or not. It's absolutely predictive. So we know that just if a person, not only if you live close proximity, your likelihood of heart disease goes up exponentially, and it makes sense. It's not just by osmosis. You're more likely to go ahead and to go to those establishments. And what subsequent studies have shown, the University of Minnesota is that partaking in fast food, which is not just by the way from a quick serve restaurant, it's also inside your grocery stores, but right? mm -hmm. the foods that you choose that are ultra processed and highly palatable, that when you do this, you increase your burden and risk of heart disease by 20%, two to three times, 40 to 50%, four to five, over five times, 80%. So we know that there's harm that's here. You go through those windows and you see the warning signs that are there. What's so interesting is that I oftentimes have patients come to me and say, doc, I don't know about this medication. I don't know about this vaccination. I'm, a, I'm afraid of the side effects, but they're not afraid of the warning that's on the fast food restaurants that say by eating here, you can have birth defects, you can lead to cancer, you can lead to heart disease. They're not afraid of all the words they can't even pronounce. 
They're not afraid of the fact the food doesn't change. Eric describes the food that sits there from fast food joints <laughs> that sit on the shelf for, for months to years and how it looks the same. He says bacteria don't even want it, right? Not even the bacteria and the fungus will eat the food. <laughs> in 1977, I matriculated to the University of Pennsylvania as a freshman, and I had my roommate's sister had to have surgery, so of course she went to Children's Hospital. And we walked in to visit her, and the first thing you saw I saw in the lobby in 1977 was a McDonald's. Now, isn't that a bit of a conflict of interest when there is McDonald's in the lobby of a hospital? I would say yes. I, I, I know Columbus talks about it. He's actually written on this. So I'll let him talk about it and then I'll chime in. Yeah, no, it, it, it clearly is. But once again, it boils down to business and business is business. And so when a company that's into making money is able to fund and donate money beyond getting a plaque, they're able to have a footprint in the presence that's, that's there. And one of the things we speak about inside of the Slate Food Project as we really try and peel away the layers of perhaps why these areas that are, are, are have food deserts and food swamps, we described really, that was brought out by a great um, book, Supersizing Urban America and Chen Zhou, and she brought out really about how during the civil rights era that the Richard Nixon administration, what they said was, listen, we need to go ahead and combat racism by uh, bringing in businesses into African-American communities. And we want to highlight small business association loans. And through lobbying and other efforts, many of those loans went to fast food restaurants who had a wider profit margin. And so they began to infiltrate that there, that they began to have a presence in multiple locations. And so we see this transition over into the healthcare industry too as well. And you know, Eric is the one who, who makes a great statement where he says resources go where value is placed, resources go where value is placed. And so we see this inside of medicine consistently consistently about the fact that we place value in the wrong place. And so if it's more about building a new wing and we'll take money and allow the presence of certain establishments there, that's problematic. It's problematic. Yeah, I had a, I had a, um, a, a friend of mine, I can't even say what part of the country it was in because um, I don't want her to ever get in trouble, but she was working as the head of um, nutrition and, diet, and dietitian, dietetics for a hospital that was a part of a major chain. In fact, the group that owns the hospital is actually known for, motive, for promoting vegetarianism. That's all I'll say. And um, she tried to simply remove red meat from that hospital as the head of nutrition and dietetics, she's whole food, she's plant-based. And she just said to the hospital, look, maybe we should take the red meat out, um, you know, just as a way, way to make our offerings more healthy. And she almost got fired just for making the suggestion because they were far more concerned with how the public rated them on dish after discharge from the hospital so that they would have people come back. And I said, it's an unfortunate truth because if there was ever a hospital with enough courage to actually feed people healthy food, um, they would actually have people drive out of their way to get to that hospital because of all of the benefits that that would have um, for their patients, even in just staying in the hospital three or four days, they would begin to see the benefits of eating healthier. Yeah, that, that part is absolutely true. That's one of the most devastating parts is the fact that our, our hospitals, our insurances, our physicians are all rated, this public rating, which is good. You want feedback from the public on how you're being treated. But when it conflicts with providing treatment and therapy, that's to their benefit. And now you have hospitals who will rather choose to maintain this level of five-star status rather than to apply it. It's understandable from a business standpoint, but not from a wellness standpoint. And from a true wellness and a therapy for true health care, not sick care, you know, there has, the system is broken and the system is defunct if it's allowing this to take place that doesn't, that doesn't encourage helpful eating. Yeah, it was the same thing with breastfeeding. And they finally came up with that designation that a hospital is like breastfeeding friendly. Um, I forget the actual title of those hospitals now, but um, it took a lot. I mean, here you are, you have women delivering babies um, and, and, the, and everything that child needs is in the mother. It's the way uh, God designed for that, you know, that child to be fed in terms of getting um, antibodies from the mother and, and healthy fats from the mother and 
uh, certain compounds that actually develop the baby's brain better and on and on and on. And yet the baby would never get a chance often to get on, get to the mother to nurse. They were given formula even before that. And that would destroy the whole process of breastfeeding. And you ask yourself, why would a hospital do that with all we knew for We've known for decades about the benefits of breastfeeding. Well, it's everything Dr. Batiste just said. I mean, it has everything to do with profits. It has everything to do with people coming in and giving samples. And 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 it's just a really sad thing because um, not breastfeeding children is probably one of the major contributors to, to cancers in this country, diabetes, and obesity. Um, just simply the fact that we don't make sure that pretty much every baby that can possibly bre- be breastfed is breastfed. It's funny that you mentioned that because just a couple, well, actually the last two guests on the show, both were pediatricians. And we talked about how there are certain circumstances in which a mother just can't breastfeed and maybe she can't get uh, milk from the bank. But what they put in formula, I don't know if Michael Moss talked about it in his book because it's been a while since I've read it. But what is baby formula? It's processed sugar, fat, and salt in breast milk. Absolutely. Oil and salt and corn syrup. I mean, they're addicting the infant from like day one. Absolutely. And, and when, when a baby nurses from the mother's breast, the ba- there's, a, there's like a natural stop. You know, naturally the baby gets full and stops. When they, when they bottle feed and it's from formula, the baby just will just keep eating and eating and eating and eating and eating and eating. And it, I remember reading years ago when I used to do a lot of uh, breastfeeding promotion work um, that literally this is probably the first step in, the, in, in having um, a population that has a dysregulated appetite because you learn to overeat even in infancy. Um, because of what we feed children. And so, again, you make you make us slaves. You know, if that formula is consistency is more like what you're going to taste at a fast food restaurant, which it is, what are you going to, what's going to happen? Now, if that mother is eating a whole food plant-based diet and nurses that child, that child is going to get the nutrients and the feeling and the taste for the diet of their mother. Oh, that's so, it's just, you know, I was born to a morbidly obese mother who bottle fed me. And it's like, it's like I was screwed from the gate. Well, you you overcame it clearly. You I overcame know, but it took me fifty years, and I'm still I know. Does anybody else to that stuff? I just don't touch it anymore. I mean, I've learned like a true drug addict that you just don't go near it. That the best amount is none. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. You know, I mean that that's the thing. I mean, what you just said, and what Eric said, is powerful because when you think about it in context, I mean, he's saying he's outlining to the audience really about the fact that at a young age, from an infancy, that if you're eating this processed food that you can overconsume, that when you have naturally occurring food, that you, you consume just the right amount that your body needs. And so it, it matches the studies that have been done time and time again, whether or not it's in rodents, whether or not it's in about overeating and sugar and fat and combination, this hyperphagia, this excessive eating that we observe, that we're overfed and undernourished considerably inside this country. And that we're seeing the ill effects of it constantly. You know, I think it was last year, I believe it was last year, that they, they CNN released an article talking about the greatest, the national security threat that's amongst us. And it's really the, 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 the pandemic of, of overweight and obesity and chronic diseases that now are not even allowing our youth to enter into the military is what we're seeing that's here. This is from our, our, our youth, our kids and our future is what we're seeing this just explode. Mm. Yeah. And, and and what happens i mean that, that just starting with formula and then you move from formula to many of the processed baby foods uh to you know the kind of foods fast food joints like you to give your children at three four years of age one of the things that's strikingly absent from all of these things is fiber um and so you you develop a palate for a diet that has no fiber you don't learn to chew fiber you don't learn to you you don't feed the good bacteria in your gut with fiber and we know that when those good bacteria are fed with fiber they actually produce fatty acids chains that actually are released into the bloodstream that signal and tell the brain we're full we're we're full because we have a colon full of fiber so we must be full because because it's fiber that far down inside of us and it turns down the appetite so imagine if you grow up on a diet completely devoid of fiber you never get that extra piece of appetite regulation and um, so you have, a, so, the, so the people are shocked. Well, we have a nation of obese people. We have a nation of people who have literally skirted several of the mechanisms that we were designed to have to actually help us to control our appetites. So it only makes sense that that's happened. And, and to your point, uh, Chef AJ, most of us actually were raised in environments 
that were obesogenic. Our mothers didn't breastfeed us, they bottle fed us. Then they gave us Pop-Tarts and, and whole milk and, and sugary cereals. And it wasn't their fault. You know, we were taught that all of these things are healthy. And you know how they duped us into thinking that is they stripped it of all its nutrients and added back four or five of them and said it was fortified. Oh, this is rich in, you know, these five <laughs> nutrients. And your mother's thinking, oh, this is good. My kid is getting vitamins and minerals, not realizing there are a plethora of other phytonutrients, micronutrients that the child needs that they're never going to eat, get eating the standard American diet. Yeah. Well, so somebody's asking, well, what, what formula can you recommend if you can't breastfeed? There is no formula that is, is good. You've got to get it from the milk bank. Donate. Yeah, my, my, my suggestion would be if you if you're in a place where you can get a milk bank and get get and feed the child that way, it's going to be a much, much better for that child. Um, after that, you know, you just talk to your pediatrician because everything after that is 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 a highly processed uh, substitute for mother's milk. Yeah, absolutely. Were you the guys that said that the, the slave food was it from you guys? I learned that the saying high on the hog came from that. Yep. I yes. That so interesting. I think, I think when we talked, we talked about that, that um, high on the hog is what the slave masters ate. Right. So mm -hmm. it's a good thing to be high on the hog, but what yeah. the slaves ate was low on the hog. It was the guts, the internal organs, the feet, the snout, um, those types of parts that have pig that should have been tossed were given to the slaves. But, well, nobody should be eating a pig at all. I mean, my it, it is, <laughs> no. nobody should listen. But here's the but it but it represents something. So it's not yes. what they were eating. It's the fact that the slave was giving the refu the refuse. The slave was given what nobody else wanted. Um, and so the slave masters obviously could eat that and then eat all of the fruits, vegetables, anything that the the the, the, the plantation produced. They could eat it. Now, many of the slaves skirted this by getting a little patch of land and being able to grow a little something, as um, Joel Furman talks about in his book, Fast Food Genocide. But um, uh, in general, the, the, you know, obviously eating pig was, was a horrible thing. And if you look at the world, I think there are a billion Muslims in the world that don't eat pork. Um, and, um, you know, there's a large contingency, a large percentage of Jews that don't eat pork, and even a pretty large percentage of Christians who, for the same reasons as the Jews, don't eat pork as well. Um, so you're right. It's not a it's not a food that should be eaten. But if you're not given if you're doing that with a pig, you're probably doing that with every other part of the plantation. And Frederick Douglass, one of the quotes we use, he talks about the fact that they gave him tainted, um, tainted um, herring. They gave them, you know, the worst uh, bit of the vegetables that might have been left over so that they had a really poor diet overall. Oy, so how can we fix this mess, guys? doing what you're just doing i mean yeah. what you do is extremely important and it's, and it's reaching people where they're at i mean listen i mean you've been how long have you been vegan it'll be 44 days? years soon wow. 44 years so so question to you right and not to try and change the interview back to you when you first <laughs> <laughs> when you first went vegan when you first went mm. vegan did you see all of the vegan products that are available now there was nothing there wasn't even soy milk there was that was there was literally nothing nothing consider whole foods nothing so it wasn't that these food companies decided out of their own altruistic benefits that they wanted to adopt and start to promote this it wasn't that it's because they figured there was a market there was a demand that that who people demanded better they demanded options that were going to be better. So it starts with the people as consumers, we have purchasing power to demand certain things. So it's about educating. We can't rely upon our physicians, our, these other pro uh, professionals that are out there completely to provide all the information, all the answers regarding nutrition. We need to, to search. We need to be curious. We live in an information society and learn and then go to your physicians and try to tease out okay, what, and help you glean and work through it. I think by doing that, the force of your dollars can help dictate what happens that then goes to legislation. You know, Eric brought up earlier, social determinants of health, which is the community that you live, you play, you work, you age, and you pass away. There's also something called political determinants of health. This is where the federal laws and judiciary system come into play and laws are implemented and regulate that set up systems for hospital regulations or for dairy checkoff or various things. And lobbying has to take place there to fight against this. But another level are moral determinants of health. And there has to be a moral code that says you deserve better, that you have the right 
to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that means revolving around uh, an energetic body and person and leaving an earth that's better off for our kids. Thank you. To what, when did you guys decide to start a YouTube channel? And I, I was really so impressed that you, you Michael Moss has a new book come, come on, coming out called Hooked and you actually hooked him for an interview. It's not easy to do that. <laughs> well, hopefully we open him up to a, um, a whole new audience too. I mean, a lot of folk who, who tune in and see our program um, don't often, you know, may not be a lot of folk who read a lot of these books. So we're hoping that we actually expose him to um, the black community and, and a, a big chunk of the black faith-based community where a lot of churches here in defense of the churches, a lot of enlightenment is beginning to happen in the churches. Um, many of the leaders, pastors are beginning to wake up and say, wait a minute, um, you know, I'm, I'm visiting too many of my members in the hospital. And there have been a few hospitals in this, a few uh, uh, churches in the South that we've done presentations for. And literally their pastors are saying, listen, enough is enough. You know, we've been feeding people soul food for all these years and all I'm doing is having to visit them in the hospital and then and then have early funerals. And I want them to eat better. So these pastors are whole food plant-based and they're trying to convince their congregations to be. It's a power. You say, what do we do about this? I mean, there are, there are institutions in our country poised to actually take this change to the masses and begin the process to overthrow what has been happening. And one of them, one of the strong ones, especially for the black community, is the church. The truth of the matter is if you got black churches to come together and many of them do what we call a Daniel fast every January from the book of Daniel. And anybody wants to see it, you read the first chapter of the book of Daniel. It's a powerful uh, uh, story of Hebrew boys who, who go to Babylon and decide not to eat the king's meat nor drink his alcohol and then are in a test against everybody else and do better. Um, and so a lot of churches do that. And a lot of folks during that time will say, man, I felt so much better in January. And then they go back to their regular ways. These pastors are saying, no, we need to stay like this all the time. So that is one of the ways that this can change is that a grassroots community efforts with community gardens, which is which are popping up more and more across the country. Um, uh, community cooking classes. I remember in, I went to Compton maybe five, six years ago, and they had not only built amazing community gardens to promote uh, healthier living, they actually had an outdoor kitchen in the middle of that garden. And that a whole thing sat on a, on, a, on a piece of land where they used to have like basketball, you know, run down basketball courts where gang members used to fight. And they transformed the land into something where now families come and sit as people do cooking demonstrations on how to prepare the very vegetables grown all around them. So good things are happening and we just got to support those good things and multiply those good things. I would love to meet some of those pastors and have them on the show because you're right. I mean, I think if the congregation would be more likely to do it. And, and if they didn't have such unhealthy food at the church, I've spoken at a lot of churches and, and, and then you speak and you say, and then everybody's like clapping and nodding. And then they have the social afterwards. And I'm like, I, I, I guess um, I should have spoke last week so that you could have had different food. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's interesting. Well, I, you know, I've been, I've been doing two things at once. I've been watching your YouTube page because I've been asking people to subscribe and you've gone up to one point from one point, I'm so bad at math. It was 1.04. Now it's 1.09. I'm trying to get you guys to 2,000 before. We <laughs> we appreciate it. If, there, if there's someone who can do it, it's you. Yeah. We know you can and your audience. Number. You need 2,000 so you can monetize and we can get, and then, and then YouTube will start promoting you yeah. to other people. I, is your show mostly you guys? I, I, I'll be honest. I haven't watched every episode. I've watched about four now. Is it mostly you guys having banter back and forth? Or are you, I noticed you had some chefs on a more recent episode. It's it's we have, a, we have a we pretty much have a guest every time now at Columbus. Once yeah. in a blue moon, we'll it'll just be us two. But you know we, you know at least you know I'll speak for myself, and I, I think I can say the same for Columbus. This really isn't about us. Um, no. I don't do this because I want attention or I want followers or I have a brand I'm trying to push. I, you know I'm I'm actually quite happy not doing be having any of that. We do this because we believe in it, and we know um, that there are people who who could use it. I know. The, the the what has helped me with you know to follow this lifestyle and we want that for other individuals and so um we bring on guests because we really want someone who can actually dig deeper into certain aspects of what we talk about in the slave food project than we even can so this week we have um someone coming on who is a a food historian 
um, Columbus can t- can say more about it. I'm about to I'm gonna watch your cl- the clip you sent me after this, but <laughs> a food historian, which is actually pretty profound. Yeah, culinary historian Jessica B. Harris, and so it's it's about bringing in experts. You know, just like Michael Moss is not quite yet hasn't transitioned towards being plant-based or anything of that sort with his knowledge, but it may happen. And so Jessica B. Harris is a phenomenal culinary historian, author, journalist. And so she's coming on to join us and really walk through this evolution of food, this food diaspora and showing that. But one of the things we try and do, just like Eric said, is we just, it's really about trying to deliver this message and bring in uh, experts into the area that can help really layer in the knowledge and the education to those who are tapping in and listening. And that's really our goal. You know, I, I joke a lot of times and I'll say that, you know, plant-based is like, it's like a superhero movie. You know, you have Wonder Woman, you have Batman, you have Superman, you have Black Panther, and it's always a good guy and the bad guy. It's always some conflict. There may be a love interest and in the end, the good guy wins. And so whether or not you're speaking the connotation of diabetes, high blood pressure, or whatever it may be, it's a similar type theme story. And so what we're trying to do is we're just creating another superhero movie. It still is centered around the history. It's centered around the, the answer and solution is coming together as a community. There's power in the community and recognizing that with stress, there's two types of stress response. There's a threat response, which trigger disease, and there's a challenge response. That challenge response allows for dilation of your, ves- your vessels and, and allows you to respond. And part of that comes together when you bond together as a community. And so we're trying to let folks know that there is a community support, just like what you're doing, even within different cultural areas, that you can move towards a, a better state of health. I'm very interested in hearing what the food historian has to say. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the documentary, The Invisible Vegan, Jasmine Leva has been on the show. And there was a food historian as as part of that documentary, because whatever the food historian says, I'm pretty sure that processed food wasn't part of our evolution. (laughs) Not at all. And, And I think that's such a, that's, you know, what's interesting is because the processed food industry makes people feel like there's something wrong with them when they can't stop eating it. And, mm-hmm. you, you know, we understand like with, with, with cigarettes or alcohol, if you have a problem with it, you can't have any, but with processed food, people keep trying. And then there's probably some people like my naturally thin husband. And it doesn't mean by the way, that just because you're thin, you're healthy. I think he is, but he could eat that crap and it's not going to affect his weight. A lot of us, it shows on the outside when we eat it. But what people don't realize is they can't have any of it. it you can't moderate something that's that's so highly addictive. At least many people can't. Well, I'd say that when I used to work in that addiction medicine uh, clinic at the VA hospital, we would have stories of people who had quit smoking for eight years, 12 years, 15 years. One New Year's Eve, I remember guys telling me on a New Year's Eve after he'd been quit for more, over 10 years, he went to a party and decided to, um, he was he just and decided to have a drink. So he started drinking and, and a friend said, hey, you know, have a cigarette. And, he's, you know, he had quit cigarettes for 10, over 10 years. He said he smoked one cigarette that night, especially after the alcohol kind of lowered his inhibitions. He had a cigarette that night. He said within 48 hours, he's back to two packs a day. One cigarette did that. It's, the, it's very similar with food, honestly. Um, you know, it just takes a little bit and it jumps you all the way back. The other thing I wanted to say, based on something you guys said earlier, is a calorie really is not a calorie. Not every calorie is really the same. Um, and sometimes we think a calorie is a calorie, but part of the reason some of these foods have to be avoided is those calories come with the ability to manipulate neurotransmitters in the brain create feelings of euphoria and, and, and create those mood swings we talked about earlier in the show. So a calorie is not a calorie. If you eat, um, you know, if you eat a bag of salty potato chips, you get a very different um, response than if you try to eat the same number of calories in carrots. You, you'd never make it through that many carrots. You'd, you'd have to stop because they don't have that. They're very filling, but they don't have that addictive, addictive nature to them. Mm. I could talk about this all day. This is my favorite thing because, you know, I was still heavy when I gave up processed food. I was still, I maintained a lot of extra weight eating very high in the calorie density spectrum of whole plant foods. But really it was even before Michael Moss's book, which was a game changer. There was a book before that, I don't know if you're familiar with, by the former head of the FDA under Bill Clinton called 
it was by Dr. David Kessler. What was it called? Uh, the end of overeating, where he started to expose the idea that sugar, fat, and salt are addictive by themselves, but even more so in conjunction. And I remember just stopping processed food immediately, even even organic, healthy, healthy vegan processed food, because when I figured out what they were doing to my brain chemistry and my palate, I said, "I'm not, I'm not giving them any more of my money. Forget it." Mm. Got me mad. It's crazy. It, it really is crazy when you stop and you think about the fact that we're legitimately a science, a science experiment. And the fact that we're so trusting when it comes to food, we're so trusting when it comes to food, we, we have a, some degree of aversion when it comes to perhaps uh, chemicals and cigarettes and medications, but with food, it's vaccines. just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> vaccines. It's, it's completely, it's completely different. It's completely different with that. I, can't, I was just getting up for a minute, but I'm not going to find it. But next time you guys are on, I was telling Dr. Walsh in the summit interview that when I, we used to teach in my home, these ultimate weight loss classes, I, I'm not kidding. It's almost 12 years old, a cinnamon bun from 7-Eleven. And it's the same. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, I, because it, and I actually used to go to a chiropractor that had a McDonald's cheeseburger that was four years old. And it, it was the same, like nothing happened to it. Wow. That's, That's not powerful. food. You know, if it, if it doesn't spoil, it's not food. Yes. That should be a part of the definition of food. It has to spoil. And I yep. like Michael Michael uh, Pollan's uh, when he says they're food-like substances, because mm -hmm. um, that really is a better way to describe a lot of these products. Right. That's why to even dignify them saying refined food or processed food, we should take food out. Here's a really interesting question, guys, from Jenny. Why is there such a push to get and keep people sick and addicted? Is it really all about greed? I don't understand why there was an undercurrent to keep us battling it keep us batting it so hard to and stay healthy in modern society it's sickening do you think it is just for profit absolutely i i wish i, I wish i wish i could say it was just you know something else but it, our system is designed you know now i'm a capitalist i believe in you know in in having markets that compete and but we our capitalism is different now our capitalism is mega capitalism we have just a few companies c completely dominate what we're exposed to so gone are the mom pop grocery stores you know you have a hard time going into a town and finding a one-off owned grocery store they still exist but you're going to find major grocery store chains that if you can't get your product into it you're not going to you know you, you it's difficult to get your product out there you have online retailers like amazon um and walmart which is a kind of a combination of online and in person that dominate all of these different things so in order for the shareholders to keep the money and um as the only way that they can keep making money the way they do is they've got to make products that will sell more next year than they did this year right and a tomato isn't going to do that all by itself uh, uh you know a head of lettuce isn't going to do that but if you create products that like you know there's these new there's one of the famous ice cream makers makes these amazing now dairy free ice creams <laughs> and I tasted one and I, and I, and I, and I told my wife, I said, yeah, this is like, it was designed by the devil. This thing is literally, <laughs> literally edible crack. I mean, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you, you, you just no way people aren't going to eat this whole tub of thing. And it's not one healthy ingredient in this whole tub. It may not have dairy, but it does have disease causing entities in it. And so for that reason, Somebody again, you people are just trying to figure out a way to make money. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm rattling my brain even as I speak, trying to figure out what other reason you would do this, and I can't. There is none. There is none. It's all about dollars. It's about dollars, and and I don't think that there was ill intent at the beginning and in the inception, but I think it became more of how can we make more money? How can we make this more appealing? How can we increase our users? How can we increase our our buyers? Right, and it's a similar mechanism. To anything else of, of drugs or anything of that sort is that there is an, an intentional state for doing it and an argument saying that now just like aj said the 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 blame is cast off of the company and onto someone else there's no personal ownership in the world period <laughs> but certainly not from the food industry in terms of saying listen we own what we've done that's the other thing that michael moss really kind of brought out in the book is he said when he went to some of these food agencies and they said okay let's make this without the sugar or without the salt he was like, it was not something that you could even taste, that you could that you could eat. He said it, it had metallic taste. It wasn't palatable <laughs> at all. Yeah. And so, and so there is a fine balance. What was meant to kind of say, how can we 
have food that can get to the masses or for the army and get the rations and have shelf life or sustainability when they're out there warfare. And then that technology was then brought to the everyday Joe and then, and then, and then put on steroids. <laughs> really, that leaves us, leaves us wanting. Well, you know, I mean, the pe- I'm an ethical vegan, by the way, obviously at 17, you don't go vegan for the environment in 1977. And I, I didn't know anything about health, but I get bashed a lot by other vegans because I, they say I make it too hard for people to go vegan because I'm against processed food and I'm for health of, of the planet, the people, the animals. And I just don't see how all this processed food, whether it's vegan or not, is contributing in any meaningful way to a healthier society. Well, and for uh, let me say this again: as an African American, you know, it see it would be insanely counterproductive to try and get Black people in America to go vegan to help save the lives of animals at the cost of their own lives. When you look at the health disparities that affect African Americans, so for us, the beautiful thing about promoting a whole food, plant based diet in our community is it will automatically save animals because African Americans actually eat more meat than anybody else. Uh, uh, when you when you do a pound for pound, except for beef, except for like steaks and beef, every mm-hmm. other animal we eat more of. So when we do this, the, the burden on animals <laughs> actually comes down further than for any other group of people. But we can't do that and not know that we're going to extend life and increase health in our community. That would be unethical for us to, you know, to, to say, well, listen, we're going to cheapen the message down so more people can do it to save more animals. And we actually continue the massive loss of life in the black community. That's something we just can't do. Yeah. And I, and I, I would say, AJ, I'm going to throw this last little bit in here is the fact that I think that anyone who make the statement that you're too hard, I think hasn't listened to you. And the fact that you are about meeting a person where they're at and giving them, listen, here's your goal. Here is your finish line. I'm going to give you a prescription on how to, I'm going to give you a trajectory on how to reach that finish line, right? And you have to adopt it. And I think that's what it's about for those of us who are trying to live, walk the walk, talk the talk, is that we understand what the process is. And it doesn't mean it's not going to be route with pitfalls that on occasion for anyone, that anyone is perfect, but it's like, keeping your eye on the prize that here's our goal. Our goal is to move towards eating whole food, plant-based um, eating, no salt, no sugar, no fat, um, and eliminating these, these processed refined foods. It doesn't mean perfection. It means intention. Every single day is what it means. Right. Okay. And, you're, and you're a great, I know we're, we're ending, but you're a great example of that. When you give the story of going from just being vegan to being whole food and plant based and how much that transition um, improved your health. And that, that's, that's quite profound as well. Absolutely. Listen, guys, I know that Dr. Batiste has to go. He has clinic today, but guys, the doctors have agreed to come back in a few days to finish this conversation and take the rest of your questions. They'll be back Sunday at 11. So be sure to come back. Be sure to subscribe to their YouTube channel. Thank you guys so much. I can't wait to see you on Sunday when we'll have part two of Liberation Nutrition. All right. Love it. Can't wait. Look forward to seeing you. All right. And who, oh, thank you guys so much for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have a wonderful plant-based gastroenterologist on named Dr. Vanessa Mendez. Thanks again.